Hello and welcome to Box to Box, the football talk show brought to you by Sportology TV with myself, Ali Drew and my co-host, Uni. In part one of this episode, we were joined by Sam Matterface, who spoke everything the season so far, controversial VAR and also the pay-per-view debate. But now we have another great guest joining us. Of course, um, this time around, we've got somebody who's been on the show before, somebody who supports the channel massively and is just is is great for us to be honest but uh he's one of the best pundits one of the greatest pundits down under in that in that part of the world he's former aston miller chelsea and man united keeper none other than mark bosnich mark, uh, how's how's life treating you at this present time i know things are sort of going up and down again in the world um how's life treating you yeah, very good. Hello to you, Inane. Hello to you, Ali. And thank you so much for having me back on the show. I've been watching it since I've been on. It's a fantastic show. Got to give you both a lot of credit. Um, well, since we last spoke, it's, it's well, it's October now, so I'm not 100% certain the month we last spoke. But um, obviously, the world is, uh, is still in the grips of a, of a pandemic. Um, uh, over here in Australia, um, where I'm living in Sydney, New South Wales, done a fantastic job. Um, they haven't locked down the economy too much, which is great. They've really balanced that out and the cases haven't really got out of hand. Unfortunately, in, in Victoria, where Melbourne is, it has. And they've been in like severe lockdown, you have to say, for the last maybe, I would say, two and a half months where they could only basically go out for exercise, essential items, and can only stay within five kilometres of their house. They're slowly but surely coming out of that. And hopefully, um, you know, quite soon, because the borders are being closed between Victoria and New South Wales, as they have between Queensland and New South Wales and, and other states, that will slowly open up uh, and we're coming to the conclusion of the rugby league and the AFL seasons and they're, they're allowed in New South Wales and in Queensland uh, to have a quarter capacity of the crowds, which, is, which this weekend will go up to half uh, of the stadium. So, so far so good. I still think we've all got a long way to go um, in terms of this uh, pandemic um, because until there's a, there's a vaccine, um, really, I, I think that the general sentiment over here is that we're going to have to try to learn to live with it. And, and basically, so that, that will mean that, uh, like I said, things will have to change. But I think we're just going to have to learn to adapt because uh, ultimately, if there's not a vaccine, well, we can't just go under the quilt and sort of just hope things are going to go away. So, uh, but other than that, look, the, it's, we're going into summer. That's another, obviously, a massive advantage. You guys are, are going into winter and to flu season. Um, so... Uh, you know, over here, like I said, we're we're, hold, we're holding out quite well. Yeah, uh, just I think the general message is just to stay safe. To be honest, to everyone else. Yeah. Uh, but um, Mark, let's talk about. Let's start off in Paris. Last night, the Champions League started the first round, the first games. Man United had a yeah. mammoth task of going back to Paris. We know last time they went there, you know, Ole made his name. Uh, this time yeah. around, they were the underdogs. Uh, but what a performance by United yesterday. Um, you know, there were certain players that came into the team. Uh, Axel Tuanzebi came in after 10 months out. Absolutely yeah. control that defence. Aaron Wan-Bissaka. There was a couple of names out there that I could pick, but I want your expert opinion on it. Uh, Mark Bosnich, what did you make of that performance yesterday? Yeah, look, listen, it was a fantastic win. Um, in terms of the performance, obviously, if you have a look at the stats, the, the possession, I mean, I think they only had something like 29% possession, which is which is like... In, in terms of, uh, in terms of, as people know, football means a lot of chasing. Yeah. Um, but I thought tactically, Oli pretty much got it spot on, as he did what was it nearly a year and a half ago when he won that amazing uh, second leg uh, when Marcus Rashford hit that penalty and uh, right in the dying minutes to take them through last time. But uh, this time round, with, with the quality uh, and the amount of possession that uh, that Par uh, PSG had. Um, I thought Oli set his team up very, very smartly. Um, you know, there were times that I was starting to get outnumbered in midfield, which can be really proved telling. Um, and, you know, he swapped things around, you know, pretty much you know, in the middle of the game, you know, went to a diamond formation in the centre. Um, and, and I think that it, they looked much more comfortable like that. And, and there's no problem as well when a team, which I think Manchester United still are a team in transition in terms of when I say in transition, Oli's still getting the players and putting together the, the culture and putting together the philosophy that he wants them to play by. These things take time. I know people just want instant things, but if you think back to even the, you know, the great managers, even Sir Alex Ferguson, it took him a long time before he started to get things exactly right. And then all of a sudden, things seem to click over. Uh, while, while this is uh, you know, occurring, and when you do come up against teams who are quality, quality sides, and PSG is a quality team, there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing wrong um, with, with setting your team up that, that first and foremost, 
that we're not going to get beat. And, you know, we're, we're going to keep it very, very tight, very, very solid. And we're going to hit them on the counter. And when you've got, you know, the likes of, of Rashford, the likes of Martial, um, who are flying machines up front, um, you know, they're at their most dangerous when they're running onto the ball and they're spacing behind them. So there's no problem in sucking the other team in and hitting them on the break, especially with the strength that you've got in midfield. Um, you know, the, the, you just got to make sure, and just that's what Oli did, I was very, very impressed with once again, they don't get outnumbered in, in midfield because regardless of how good your players are, if you are, if you are outnumbered you know, at the top level, um, you know, you're going to get completely dominated and to a point where you just tire out so much that it's inevitable that the other team are going to score. Was there any players that stood out for you yesterday that gave you that performance? Because just looking at sort of the player ratings and just going through what other people have spoken about, uh, certain names that came up was Aaron Wan-Bissaka, Chuan Zabi, David De Gea, Fred. Um, mm. So uh, was there anyone that, you know, when you were watching the game, anyone that stood out for yourself? Yeah, well, I think those players that you mentioned, um, obviously Rashford scored another fantastic goal. David De Gea made some very, very important saves. And if you are going to play in that manner, and step back, your goalkeeper and your defence have to be absolutely spot on. Um, Fred, you, get, you gave a mention too, who was excellent in the middle. Um, and, and all the players in the middle, for me, done an absolutely fantastic job. But uh, it, if, for me, I'm a little bit biased. If I had to pick out one, I'd probably say David De Gea is the goalkeeper. Um, but I tr truly think it was a true team effort. And like I said, and that comes sort of stemmed down from the manager all the way down. And like I said, you know, th there's, it just goes to show, because football is, is such a game where goals are at a premium, um, you know, sometimes you have to just say, hold your hands up and say, look, listen, we're coming up against a team that are going to want to keep possession, that are going to keep possession better than us. It's no problem, you know, in, in sort of being honest with your team and saying that. But this is how we're going to set it up because, yes, the most popular way to control the game is with the ball. But you can also try to control the game without the ball and the way that you structure your defence and the way that you move the opposition to areas of the pitch where you think that they're least dangerous and, and where you think that you can maybe dispossess them and then you can hit on the break for those fast players, which they have. Actually, just going off what you're saying then, uh, Mark, is, is Ole sort of better set up for like, a, a knockout competition for the Champions League or for the FA Cup? Because we know that in the league, United have struggled when the team has sat back. They've got the low block. Yeah. United have tried to break them down. It's never worked for you. Or it hasn't really worked out well for United. Um, yeah. But when a team comes to attack, most of the time, uh, United do tend to sort of suck you up and have that counter-attack in play. Um, so are United sort of better set up for maybe a competition than they, than they are the league? Well, at this moment in time, yeah, I, I wouldn't say entirely in cup competitions, but I would say I would say that they're better set up for teams that come onto them, um, whether that be home and away. Now, the home and away thing is pretty much, it's, it's not as a big a factor uh, as it was pre-COVID because there's no crowds and everything. Um, you know, that you, people don't realise what an influence that has, you know, when there's crowds and so forth. And that includes even at home. For a team like Manchester United to sit back at home, you know, and to have, you know, 70,000 people on their back, that, that it's, it's very difficult to do, you know, without sort of thinking, all right, I'm, you know, to basically going like, I, I want to shut these people up, we will go forward. But I think regardless if it's a cup competition or a league game, that it, right this moment in time, and the fact that they're in uh, transition, like I said to you, I think they are better set up to suck teams in and to hit them on the break. And there's no shame in that whatsoever. You know, like I said, it, each team has got to play to its strengths. Now, post the, the great Barcelona side, and I'm talking about the Pep Guardiola side, the Iniesta, uh, Xavi, uh, Messi, et al. side. Um, all teams around the world wanted to play in that one. And there's no, there's, there's you know, nothing wrong with that whatsoever. It was the most beautiful football and the most successful football that we've seen in such a long time. Um, but not everybody can play like that because those three players I just mentioned, um, you know, they're three players that come around once every hundred years. Um, so, but everyone's got in their mind that they, but you know, football's about different styles and about different ways of winning things. And like I said, there's no shame in saying, okay, well, look, we not be, we, we can't control the game with the ball because we're not as good as them in possession, but we'll try to control it without the ball. And you can do that as well. It's not as pleasant to the eye, but it can be done. Last night, Chuan Zabi played a great, he played a great game. First game in a while that he's, he's back. Mm. Do you think he's done enough to be part of the team maybe this weekend against Chelsea, bearing in mind that Harry Maguire may be coming back in the team. What do you think, you know, Ollie should do there? Which player was that? Sorry, Ali. To Anzeba. To Anzeba. He, he played in defence, central defence. Yes, to Anzeba. Sorry, I didn't, I, yeah. I didn't grab that. Yeah. Look, 
I'm a great believer that you don't try to fix something unless it's broken. Now, with the amount of games that come up and travel and so forth, you don't realise how many times in, in football people have certain knocks and all that, and they don't really say anything publicly, but you're not 100%. And with the, the size of squads that you have, um, you know, it's always easy at the way out to say, okay, we'll rest you. But for me, I, I thought that he was excellent. Um, and, and basically, if he's fit and raring to go, I don't see any reason why he shouldn't start again this week against Chelsea. Um, like I said, I, I thought that the defence overall and the goalkeeper were excellent last night and they were very, very important. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a huge game against Chelsea, um, you know, coming up straight on. And, and there's nothing wrong with keeping momentum, um, you know, because you can't go too much, you know, it used to be in the past that there were too many games and players are playing too many games. We need more players to do more rotation. But I think sometimes now we've gone a little bit too much the other way. We've gone a little bit to say, OK, well, yeah, you can't play three games in a week. You can. As long as you're okay and you feel okay and, and, and basically from a physical or mental perspective yeah. that you're okay. So it can be done. And, and like I said, as long as everyone's okay and fit and raring to go, I don't see no reason why you wouldn't change a winning side. Mark, what do you make of uh, Mark Rashford, this 22 or 23-year-old yeah. who's making waves on a political level, who's used his platform yeah. to make waves in the UK on a political level, and now he's turning up, well, not now, but he has always been turning up performances like he did yesterday. Um, mm. What do you make of somebody so young making such an impact uh, to the to the to world football and on a political yeah. scene as well? Well, I, I think he's been uh, I think he's been very brave, but I also think he's he's doing something that um, is benefiting other people, and he's using his platform to do that. And I don't think there's nothing wrong with that at all. I know at the beginning a lot of people were saying um, sort of stick to football, and and the majority of cases that that actually is probably the right the right thing to to do and the right thing to say to somebody. But we're talking about feeding children here. And he's been in that position before. Um, so he can empathise greatly with that. And, uh, and he's putting his name uh, to a cause that is, is helping people. And when you're trying to help people, even though it might get you in trouble, whether it be in the short run or the long run, um, I, I don't think you can ever lose in terms of, you know, because your intent is the right thing to do. And I think that that, that benefits everyone. And, and all he's trying to do is, use, is to use his position um, to, to make sure um, that kids that were in his position when he was that age, um, you know, don't go hungry. Uh, and really, it, it's sort of, you know, I, it's hard, but it is, you know, we, we're very lucky, all of us three, to live in Western, in Western countries. And when I say Western countries, you say countries that are well off. So, yeah. you know, Britain, uh, one of the richest countries in the world, so is Australia. Um, and it's hard to stomach that the fact that, that there are still people for whatever that reason may be, um, you know, we can't put food on the table. So that's, that's really, really hard. So for somebody to um, to go above and beyond and to try to help them and to use his position when he doesn't have to really, all you can just turn around and to say is well done. And I think it's important when he's doing this that he keeps doing it on the pitch because if his performances start to slip, there's no doubt in my mind um, that eventually the, the manager will turn around and say, look, listen, we understand what you're doing. We think it's great what you're doing but it's starting to affect you on the pitch. But that's not happening. I think that's very, very important too. Last night, um, another Champions League game, Chelsea, another former team of yours, they drew. It wasn't the best start for them. What did you make of that performance? Yeah, it was, it was a little bit, you have to say, it was, it was a little bit scrappy, but they are coming up against a team who are a very, very accomplished side, and especially in Europe. Um, and... Uh, uh, I, I think it was important for them to keep a clean sheet after what happened on the weekend. Obviously, Mendy coming back was important for them uh, in goal. Um, you know, Kepa has been in and out. We, we all know about that. Um, and, uh, and like I said, it was an easy game for them to slip up. But I think after the fact that, you know, they basically had the game in the bag uh, on the weekend against Southampton and let it slip, and for them to come back and not to concede, I think that was so important for them, really, because they're still a very young side. You talk about in transition, we know how much money that Frank has spent on this side, uh, it's going to take them time to, to properly gel. But during that time when, you know, when you are gelling and that you do, you, you are vulnerable um, to, to getting the type of results that you wouldn't normally get and you wouldn't normally associate with, with a team like Chelsea. Um, so I think it was important for them to, to steady the ship, so to speak, and to not to be beaten because after the weekend, you know, like I said, it would have, they would have come off feeling as though they'd lost that game on the weekend. You know, when, when in reality they should have won it, you know, and should have, well, they were winning it quite comfortably. Uh, and in the end, um, like I said, they, they only picked up a point. They would have come off having that feeling. So you've got to pick yourself up very, very quickly. And there's no respite at the top level. Like I said, you're coming up against a team with very, very experienced, 
very, very successful in Europe. Um, won the Europa League. I can't remember how many times now. I think it's about yeah. six or seven. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and and like I said, and and uh, and. and you know, it, it was important that he didn't get beaten last night. That it still puts him in good shape um, going forward. Always important in those early games in the Champions League to make sure you build up a position that uh, that you don't have to basically go into the last two games that you need six points or or you need to rely on other teams to to lose or you need to score more goals. It's always good to have these points up at the beginning. Mark, you were a former goalkeeper, and we know that keeping clean sheets is is great for the confidence, great for the team. Is is probably like one of the foundations of, of a successful team. Um, so how much does that clean sheet mean to Chelsea? Because they've been leaking a lot of goals in, as well as a lot of the big teams. Uh, Chelsea, we know that one of their main problems is the defence, and it still seems yep. to be. But getting that clean yep. sheet yesterday, how much, how much of a great, uh, how, much, how good is that for their confidence going forward? Well, it will be. Um, you know, and to be, to be fair, again, uh, you know, the goalkeeper coming in, I mean, he's, that's his second game. He's played in the second clean sheet as well. Um, so it is very, very important, as you know, for the confidence of the whole team. But the ultimate thing for, for a manager, it's always better, put it this way, somebody used to tell me in football, it's always better to win 4-3 than, than to draw nil-nil. But when you are conceding the goals that you're conceding, um, it, it, it does wonders because there's nothing worse for, you know, and strikers will tell you that when they score three goals or four goals, that should be enough to win the game. And then, then they feel, you know, every time the ball goes up the other end, they think, oh God, the other team are going to score. And that can reverberate throughout the team. The team are never quite certain or never quite sure that, that they're okay. You know, the team should be thinking of themselves, especially when they're away from home, two goals should be enough. You know, we, we should not be beaten from this situation. But we've seen, especially this season in the Premier League, a lot of people have been obviously talking about as to why uh, the amount of goals that have been scored. I mean, there's a, a variety of theories, um, but uh, there has been a lot of goals that's been scored. And, and the bottom line is the game is about goals. As much as everybody wants to keep a clean sheet, especially goalkeepers, um, if I'm a fan, which I am now, I, I don't go to the ground to see clean sheets. I go to the ground to see goals. So, so that's what it's about at the end of the day. But like I said, after the weekend, after the Southampton thing, uh, that, that was fantastic for Chelsea. Looking back to the Premier League last week and United's performance against Newcastle they won yeah. um important for them for that game what would you say you know, how important was that win for United and to have you know, to win and dominate the game really well Ali was massive because we all know you know before international break what happened at Old Trafford against Tottenham um and, and that was an absolute disaster um you know they've never considered four goals before half time at Old Trafford uh, and you know, I was just putting myself in some of those posi- poor guys' positions, and even the staff alley, thinking to myself, you know, if you didn't have international duty, you'd be you'd be in bits because normally there's a game coming two or three days later, or at least a week later, that you can put that behind you. But they didn't. You know, they didn't have a game for 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 quite some time. So it, it was so so important, and especially after going down so early to a you know a rather fortuitous goal, own goal uh, for Newcastle. And it's not an easy place to go, Newcastle United, at the best of time. Um, again, coming back to the fact there's no crowd this time, okay, but still, um, you know, it's, it's not an easy place to go. And, and Newcastle have been travelling okay. You know, they're, they're not being a particularly, you could say, an easy team to beat, so to speak. Or as long as if they've been going through a, a really shocking time, they haven't. They're, they've been a team actually that's, uh, that's been a little bit dangerous thus far. So I think that was the beginning of, you know, to say, look, you know, you know, and that is a real true test of, of, of mentality of, of anyone in any walk of life. When you do suffer a defeat or when you do stumble, that you get back up to your feet and you keep going. And they did that immediately. So could you imagine the reaction now of what we'd be talking about if they lost that game 4-1 and if they'd lost last night to PSG? You know, then you're talking, especially from Ollie's perspective, a completely different dimension. So it was a fantastic comeback especially after the result two weeks ago. That, that result was obviously as well that was amplified by the sending off of Martial against, against Spurs. Um, but regardless, 6-1 is 6-1. So to come back and to do that, and, and to do that with, with, with a little bit of style and panache, and again, not, not afraid to sit back and hit them on the break. You saw a lot of their goals come from that. And, and like I said, if you go back through their history, you know, at the start of the Premier League, um, you, know, you two guys w- would have been very, very young. But in 1992-93... Um, it was us at Aston Villa, Norwich and, and Manchester United going for the title. And, and they had three lightning plays in Lee Sharp, Andre Kinchelskis, this is Manchester United talking about, and Ryan Giggs. And they had no issue. You know, they had Steve, Steve Bruce and Gary Palliser at the back and Dennis Irwin and, uh, and Paul Parker. No issue in dropping deep completely and devastating teams on the break. 
I remember one time, you know, right with about five or six games to go, they played Norwich at Carrow Road, and it was sort of you know top of the table type of thing, you know. And uh, and they devastated Norwich with, with their counter attacking play, and basically had the game wrapped up after twenty minutes. So, like I said, there's nothing wrong in doing that. Um, you just got to play. You got to sit down. You got to be totally honest with yourself and and your team, and say these are our strengths. This is what we do excellently. This is what we're okay at. And this is what we're not so good at. So we'll try to lead that as possibly can. And what Manchester United have shown is and what they're excellent at, and, and you touched on it before, Rooney, is, is hitting teams on the break. Um, and there's, like I said, and when you've got that type of pace, um, there's nothing wrong with that because if teams sit off you and you've got that type of pace, that can be quite nullified. So then you've got to come up with something different. But right this moment in time, teams think Man United are a little bit weak. We're going to go for them. So there's no problem in sitting back. Crystal Palace have done it very well since the Premier League's resumed, uh, you know, with AU... And Zahara from they've done it excellently. Uh, Mark, we can't let you go without asking you about Aston Villa and their great start to the season. <laughs> yeah. I gave the best to last, they say, so I thought I'd save this one to last. You know, uh, Villa have been phenomenal. Uh, some of the signings that uh, Dean Smith's made, we look at the keeper, has been great. Ross yeah. Barkley's just been an absolute phenomenal signing. Jack Grealish has just picked up his form even further. Talk to me about them, man. Um, it's yeah. just been a great start to the season. It is absolutely fa- and it's a fantastic story. And, um, you know, a lot of people say, calm down, they haven't had a defeat yet and all that. And that's understandable, yes. And, and you know, we just spoke about that, uh, Ali and Nuni. We just spoke about when you do, uh, or when you are, def- if you are defeated, you might go through the whole season undefeated. I don't know, but if you are defeated, then it's a true test of seeing how the team is and how they come back from that. Um, so we'll, we'll be waiting for that. But they deserve all the credit that they're getting at the moment. Um, you know, and the league table very rarely lies. And I know it's early doors, but it has some phenomenal victories, no less so than the one against Liverpool 7-2. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, the new signings, like you, you just mentioned, uh, Ross Barkley coming on, on loan as well. I think he's on loan, uh, has been absolutely fantastic. And, and I think as well, it gave a great fillip to the club that Jack really decided to stay, that he put pen to paper. And I think everybody in and around the club were like, wow, okay. You know, he's shown his intent. You know, he could have quite easily left. You know, we, we, we stayed up by the skin of our teeth last season. Um, you know, let's not go through that again. And let's, you know, let's really try to get everybody playing to their absolute potential. And when they do, as they've seen it, I, you know, I really do think that they should be aiming for the top six. There's no, there's no reason why they can't do that. And don't underestimate how much confidence that they will now get from the fact that they beat, uh, you know, arguably the best team in the world at the moment, Liverpool 7-2. You know, regardless of the fact there was no people, regardless of this and that and the other, to beat a team that's the world club champions, you, you, you have to say, and, you know, perennial Premier League champions, um, is, uh, is an absolute... If 7-2 is a phenomenal feat. Um, and, uh, and, and that should be always in the back of their mind whenever they have any doubt to say, look, you know, we, we beat one of the best teams in the world, so we can beat anyone if we're all at our best. And that's basically what they've been doing. Dean Smith and John Terry at this moment in time deserve all the credit that, that in the world. There's no, there's no doubt about that. There's no reason for them, like I said, to, if they can keep believing uh, and keep doing the things that they are doing, there's no reason why they can't finish very high this season. Mark, how big was your smile when that 7-2 result happened? How big was it? <laughs> I thought it was... A, look, I, look, sometimes I stay up, you know, and stuff like you'll see on my Twitters and all that, you'll see me staying up and this, that and the other, because now with the time difference, so now uh, our clocks are going forward because we've got daylight saving and I think you guys will, will slowly put your clocks back soon. Yeah, this so week, it's a little yeah. bit more. Yeah, so it's a little bit more different. So usually the early game now kicks off here around 10.30, 11 at night. Saturday night it's okay, I'll stay up all the way through. But if it's on a Sunday, which that was, <laughs> you know, and you, and you want to get up early, like that, so usually, but, you know, on the coverage that we have here, we can watch mini matches and this, that and the other the next day. But, you know, it's, it's hard not to to put your phone on first thing in the morning for it, just normally, as you know, and then to have a look and sort of say, and then I looked at it and I thought, because my eyes are starting to get a little bit funny now, I think it's because of all the mobile, like phone I use, um, you know, and I'm too proud to start to go to a, to a spec saver and get some glasses. So <laughs> I actually thought it was a misprint. Yeah. And I, I rang up my mate. I said, uh, I said, um, th- was that the result last? He said, yes, yeah, seven, two. And I was like, oh my God. So I straight away put on, I didn't even put on the, I put on the full game, straight away put on the full game. It was amazing, absolutely amazing. Um, and you're still sort of waiting, sort of thinking, oh, no, it isn't. But as it kept going, I thought, okay, well, it is, it's 7-2. Um, but uh, another good win against Leicester, as you said. And, and funny enough, um, you talk about memories, they're, they're going to come up against Leeds uh, this week. Um, Leeds have been a team that everyone sort of has taken upon as, as their second side because of, 
the way that they play and Marcello Bielsa and, and all that. And it won't be an easy game. It brings back a lot of memories because I think the last time Aston Villa won a major trophy, I think, was in 1996 when we beat Leeds at Wembley 3-0. Um, so I think that was the last time they won a major trophy. They might have won something like a, I don't know, Intercity Fairs Cup or Fair Play Trophy since then. But I think that was the last major trophy that we won. So that will, that will bring back some memories. And that is the, I think that's the early game this week. I, I was looking down before, uh, I was looking at somebody else's phone because on my phone, I normally got all my stats there, but I've got you two on my phone, so I can't look while I'm doing the interview. <laughs> Before we finish, I do want to yeah. ask you, obviously, as a former goalkeeper, um, the yeah. sort of news of the goalkeeper is Pickford's tackle on Van yeah. Dijk the other day. Um, yeah. I just wanted to get your opinion on the fact that no action was really taken. There was no yellow card, no red card, you know, yeah. and he's out for that. He's going to be out for a while. He needs surgery. Yeah. What's your views on that? Well, I said it the other night, Ali. I, I don't know if, if, if uh, yourselves or your viewers, you watch Sky Sports News, you probably do that, but I usually do a, a piece um, around 8.30. I think it's around 8.30 in the morning, your time on Monday morning. It's like a little bit of a wrap-up, you know, views of the weekend. And, and look, and I was so shocked at the time that, um, that, that the referees at Stockley Park didn't see what, what I saw and I think what pretty much everyone around the world saw that it was excessive force. Um, and, you know, if you're talking about gradings for cards, you know, for those people who aren't all over the rules, you know, careless explains itself what it actually is, and that requires just a warning. Reckless, you know, is, you know, disregard for, for the opposition uh, in a reckless way and requires a yellow card. But excessive force is disregard for the opposition using excessive force uh, and requires a red card. Uh, above that is violent play, which I don't think it was, or serious, uh, sorry, a serious foul play, or violent conduct, which I don't think were those. But I definitely think it was excessive force. Um, and and I, I truly believe, and I, I came out and said this, and I had a few conversations with people on Twitter and that about this. Um, I truly believe that we're coming to a time, and, and I just want to reiterate that, uh, whereby to change people's mindsets because to stop these lunges and, and sort of, you know, you could say, you know, sometimes changing people's careers or even ruining people's careers for, you know, for good, that we have to start thinking about, when we talk about, you know, VAR and this, that, and the other, start thinking about uh, putting, to say, if it's reckless or above, that you know that if, it, that if, regardless if you mean it or you don't, and I don't think Jordan Pickford meant it at all, but I'm just talking about the mindset that you will be suspended for as long as that person is out. Now, somebody brought up with me, which is a fair point, back in 19, I think it was 1994, 95, we were playing at Villa Park against Tottenham Hotspurs. And the, the, I think there was a ball played through, it was a very windy night, and Tottenham played at the back, headed it through, and it was bouncing through, and Jürgen Klinsmann was coming for it, and I thought I could come and head it before him. So as I've come to jump out to head it, uh, and I think I actually did, get my head to at the end or I think it was Paul McGrath who just had it before me but I've clipped Paul McGrath and I hit Jürgen Klinsmann with the side of my like the side of my uh, buttock right in his face and it, and it was like you know it, it, it hurt him it hurt him badly I could tell straight away and a lot of people brought that up saying oh you hypocrite and this that and the other and this is what I said to one person no I'm saying that from experience because if there was that deterrent that I just spoke to you about Ali and Nune to say Mark, I was saying myself, Mark, you know, if you mistime this, even though I didn't mean it at all, but if you mistime this and you accidentally injure somebody, you could be out as long as they're out. I really don't think I would have got involved in that scenario. So that's what I'm talking about to change the mindset. Now, a lot of people said also about the outcry because I think people are just, like I said, coming back to what I said before about people not coming to the game to see clean sheets. Very few people come to the game to see tackles. I don't go to the game. If I went to the game with you, Ali, and I turned around and said, oh, by the way, that was the best tackle ever. Like, okay, yeah, there were six goals scored as well. I know it was a good tackle, but, you know, let's talk about the goals. Like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, you know, it, it's just too much at stake. You're talking about somebody who's going to be out now for the rest of the season. Now, I know Jordan Pickford, like I said, is going through a bad time. And, you know, a lot of, you know, people saying, oh, he didn't. It's, this is nothing personal against him uh, at all. Okay? It's just basically, see, I, I truly believe that they had given him a red card. The tackle from Richarlson... On Tiago, I don't think that occurs because Richarlson knows I've already seen something, you know, which which was not, you know, which was nowhere near to be fair as bad as the tackle on Tiago. But I'm not going to even risk this. So I'm saying in future, I think we should have to uh, to take a look at that to say if it's a tackle that's reckless, and if you look under the rules, the IFAB rules, reckless, and exactly what it says, 
and above and it injures somebody and they're out for a considerable time, then you will be out for that considerable amount of time. Then you'll have players thinking about before they start lunging in. That, that is my whole point. Interesting. Mm, well, Mark Bosnich, it's always a pleasure talking to you about football. It's always good to pick your brain. Um, and, you know, hopefully things get better in the world. We get to see you more on Sky Sports in the UK. <laughs> yeah. Because it's very hard to still see you anywhere else. But, yeah, it's been a pleasure. You know, uh, always good talking football with you. Um, so hopefully we can do that soon again at some point as well. Likewise. Stay safe, Bernie. Stay safe, Ali. Thank you so much as well for letting me off last night. And, and, and please call any time. And next time I'm going to try to make sure I get a laptop <laughs> so I can have my phone to look at all the stats so I don't have to start looking at my book. And this, that, the other. Well, Bosley, thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you so much, guys. Thanks, Mark. Hope you enjoyed this episode of Box to Box. We had Sam Matterface in part one and Mark Bosnich in part two. We have lots more coming up, so make sure you're subscribed to the channel so you can see what's to come. Make sure you like and leave some comments so we know your opinions. And we will see you next time.